Level 6, which is going to be about ethics education. And I am very pleased to announce that our first speaker is Dr. Laurie Lacombe, who is the Sidney G. Page Jr. Professor of Bioethics and Humanities, Professor of Hemonc and Palliative Care, and Director of the Hospice and Palliative Medicine Fellowship at Virginia Commonwealth University, from which she retired on Friday, and on Monday will be starting work at the University of Iowa. So I guess her husband is moving the family and she'll take a plane to the other side of the country. Her research and clinical focus has always been on provision of cancer and palliative care for marginalized populations. Um, in her past, Dr. Lickham completed both her medical degree and residency training at Creighton University. Lori, welcome back to Chicago and to the Midwest. Good morning, everybody. Um, my topic is um, medical ethics education. And I've just been, every year, been dying to come back and talk about medical ethics education. And I learned so much about it um, when I was here. And I got to be one of the educators and one of the small group leaders. And that was wonderful. And I took that back with me when I went to VCU to start the ethics program there. But um, I sometimes feel that even after 20 years or so of doing this, I, I'm not really sure what I'm doing. <laughs> and so um, I, I know hopefully many of you got the survey that I sent out. Um, and thank you so much for completing it and sending it back because I still feel like we need to talk more about it and have more dialogue because I still don't know that, um, let's see, I have to figure out how to do this. Um, that after 20 years and 10 years later, after this sort of seminal article was um, written in the academic in academic medicine, where Eccles and others said the time has come to organize an effort to improve and validate medical ethics education, did this big survey of deans of medical schools across the country, and found out that everybody was teaching it in every different way, and teaching all kinds of different things, and evaluating in different ways, um, that there really wasn't any one sort of common theme. And um, so I thought, well, let me send out a survey to people who I know are at the cutting edge and just really doing wonderful things with teaching ethics. And it really hadn't changed very much. And I'm going to present um, those um, results today. And I'm hoping that I can get through this fairly quickly because I learn so much when I come here once a year and listen to the questions and answers and also um, am able to have lunch and, and network with people and find out what they're doing. And I take always take great ideas back. Um, with me, and hopefully many of you do too. So that's what I'm here to do. Um, so the nice thing is that both the LCME that accredits medical schools and the ACGME both require some sort of ethics education, and that really gives us at least some um, something to say to the deans and to the, and to the directors who often think that it's fluff and often uh, don't give us very much time in the curriculum. And I always come back to them and say, look at this part of the LCME. A medical school must teach medical ethics and human values and require its students to exhibit scrupulous ethical principles in caring for patients and in relating to patients' families and to others involved in patient care. Each school should assure that students receive instruction in appropriate medical ethics, human values, and communication skills before engaging in patient care activities. As students take on increasingly, um, oh, I think that got deleted. I'm sorry about that. Um, in student-patient interactions, there should be a means for identifying possible breaches of ethics in patient care, either through faculty resident observation of the encounter, patient reporting, or some other appropriate method, which tells me that part that it shouldn't just be one or two ethics educators, but it should be the whole faculty that is educated to some degree in clinical medical ethics. The ACGME is less specific, um, but it's really great to go through the common program requirements for almost any of the residency programs, including pathology and radiology, and find that they require ethics education, but it's not very specific. 
um, in, in the new Milestones project, um, where they're evaluating uh, resident competency a very different way, in a better way, in a more specific way, there are multiple ethics-based competencies. And you could really say, as you go through it, that ethics is the underpinning of everything that people do in clinical medicine. Um, and they do actually even have one of the milestones that is exhibits integrity and ethical behavior in professional conduct. So there are, um, there are some sort of, there's backing for us to be teaching ethics in both the undergrad and the graduate medical education. So some of the questions that I have, and I've been thinking about for years, and I ask people when I meet people that are teaching are, should there be a core curriculum that everyone teaches? Should there be a certain amount of time required? Should evaluations be uniform? What about teaching methods? How do we measure outcomes? How do we even know that teaching ethics works? Um, I, sort of scoured the literature for anything that would tell me whether it works or not, and it's really hard to find. What matters, and I think one of the, um, uh, one of the presentations is going to address some of this. Is it virtue or is it skills? Can virtue be learned? Can the virtuous physician be developed? And so these are the, um, these are the questions that I asked of the attendants here, and thank you so much because I couldn't believe it. I've got almost 100 responses. So that was amazing. Um, so uh, first one was, are you involved in ethics education? About 35 said no, and 65 said yes. And these are the ways that they said they teach ethics. Um, flipped classroom was, um, is sort of a newer concept, but people are using it so that they can get more time in the classroom with, pay, with um, the students. Video vignettes, case discussions, I think happily, it won out as the top um, method for education. Plenary discussions, small group work, we're still doing a lot of lecturing, um, and I'm not sure that that's the best way to teach ethics, um, but uh, I think when it's accompanied by case discussions and other things, it seems to work. And then uh, reflection came out as being one of the top methods um, for um, education, so that was really exciting. And then for evaluation of the medical students, the MCQ exam, um, not a lot of people use that, although I'm finding that there are some skills and some knowledge, pieces of knowledge that are very testable, things about advanced directives, um, parts about decision-making capacity, other things that are very knowledge-based uh, that I think you really can use for an MCQ exam. And when we have 245 medical students in our uh, medical school at VCU, and it's really hard to grade more than, you know, 40, uh, 40 or so um, essays or reflections, so sometimes MCQs have to work. But a lot of people use essays for evaluation, reflection, um, peer assessment, self-assessment, and then other things. Now the most important, of course, were the qualitative questions. So the first one was, what are the challenges or boundaries that you see? And I'm just gonna sort of aggregate them first and say one of the biggest one was time. Time both for the instructors to teach and to grade and evaluate, and for the students and residents, finding time in their curricula and in, their, in the residents, especially their busy lives, um, getting them interested, recruiting small group leaders, so interest in, from both the, the teachers and the small group facilitators, and then interest from the residents and students. Um, funding is a really tough one uh, for teachers, coordinators, programs, and standardized patients. And as many places are moving to more of an RVU-based type of reimbursement, for, especially for physicians, I think um, they're finding uh, less and less time to uh, become small group facilitators where they don't see that their time is valued. And then lack of faculty expertise. Lack of clinical experience to contextualize medical ethics lessons. Um, a couple of people said, you know, it's really hard for students to, to really understand what I'm talking about when they're in their first and second year before they start the clinics. Lack of interest and even pushback by program director. 
Um, having no right answers, one person wrote, or having solutions to problems that seem difficult to obtain. And making reflection not feel like forced reflection. Plagiarism was one, and no consequences if it is discovered. One person said, lack of integrity among administrators when students cheat. Another person said, the need for clinicians involved in the educational process to be relieved from responsibility to think about ethics because of time pressure and wanting the bioethicist to just do it and give them a solution. Also, the mistaking of ethics consultation for a legal protection rather than an educational opportunity. And one person said, none. Everything works perfectly as if we were in heaven. <laughs> There were a couple of contenders I could think of for that answer. <laughs> if you had unlimited time and resources, how would you change your course? And again, the aggregates are more case-based discussions. People found that they really thought that the case-based small group discussions were the richest and the best way that students could learn. More communication skills with standardized patients more patient panels, more standardized patients. Um, very difficult to fund standardized patients. They're really expensive. Essay-based or verbal argument evaluations to meet more often. More time to show movie clips and discuss books. One person said, maybe have a little cam follow me around which could blur faces and erase identities and yet allow the context to be seen and heard. Ethics consultation would meet like morning report, with debriefing and de-stressing of staff and or families after issues arise, but if not escalated. Foster doctor care amongst the physicians to lessen guilt and burnout. One person said, I would redo it in fourth year medical school and then have the students compare and contrast how their thinking evolved with experience. Um, and we've actually done that, and that's been a really neat process for the fourth years to sort of come back and teach and um, talk about some cases that they had been presented with in their first year, and then come back and, and talk and say, boy, this looks really different to me now. Another person said, would train more faculty and residents in principles of ethics and have them help teach the ethics curriculum to residents and medical students. So lots of faculty development in ethics. And that seems like that, that really works. And then it gets everybody energized. Um, it would be nice to create a critical mass of knowledgeable ethics educators that will help design and carry out an ethics curriculum. And that one person again said, I would get everyone a million dollars. <laughs> so again, my questions are about the core cur curriculum. Should there be a certain amount of time required? Should evaluations be uniform? Teaching methods, how do we measure outcomes? What matters? Does anything matter? Is it virtue or is it skills? Or is it both or neither? Can virtue be learned? And can we really develop virtuous uh, physicians? So I'd like to turn the lights up um, and bring people to the um, microphones and hear what you have to say. Hi, September. Hi, Lori. <laughs> Lori and I went to medical school together. Most people don't realize that I am a product of Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, <laughs> where we did have a lot of, lot of um, sort of focus on, on ethical issues as we were coming up. And Lori by now figured I would probably be a novelist, which I am, and <laughs> not a doctor any longer, but definitely a filmmaker. Here's the thing, is that I feel very strongly that some of the guidelines that have been developed around what a bioethicist is and what the attributes of a bioethicist are should be the focus of what we try to do with, with students and with people when we're training. The issue is to not focus just on the case, but to focus on how they can learn to facilitate cases and facilitate certain and to develop the attributes while they're in training and not to suppress their natural 
instincts. I sort of think about the priest who used to come into our anatomy lab, because that's where we were. Then we would run on the track, and we would, so it was integrated into who we were, that we would begin to ask questions. The mistake that I'm finding is I did provide that comment about I'm mistaken for a legal stamp, right? <laughs> or, um, or people just w want to do it. The big problem that I'm having is getting people to understand that everybody needs to be a bioethicist. So that is not, we've fallen into the subspecialty issue, right? So we need for everybody to think that within them, as the man who broke the US Public Health Service syphilis study said, it's in the main, it is within each of us to know. It is within each of us to know. It's not something that you send to a specialty to do. And the value that I'm finding is missing is that when I do an ethics consult, the person who's actually managing that patient is losing the ability to interact with that patient on those oh. issues. And the cachet that you get from doing that with a family and over time and over multiple admissions and is what they're missing. So I would... Have you done any like tracking over time? Like when medical students are students where they have a case where they see it over and over again, like the guy that got hit by a tractor when we were in first year and I saw him for two years on four different services to kind of track those issues, pick a patient and see how often that's you see That's a great idea. Uh, Does anybody do that? So that's, a, that, so that's my thing. I'd like to see people tracking. Uh, over the years they're in medical school. Hi Maggie. Thank you, September. Hey Lori. Thank you for that. I, uh, I'm at Hopkins and I spend a huge amount of my time teaching ethics throughout the hospital. So I have this really cool job. I get to teach ethics to the surgery residents, the peds residents, the medicine residents, OBGYN, neurology, adolescent psych. I mean we just, it's a really, Hopkins has really embraced um, the notion of ethics education uh, even with some funding. But I think even though I have, I mean, it's really, we get to do some pretty incredible stuff, but I, one of the questions that will always come back is, can you show that ethics education works? Exactly. And I think that that's a really big deal, except that maybe the answer is no, and we should stop trying to show that it works, because in the short term, it's very difficult. We could also ha say, have a different sort of approach and say, here are the goals of ethics education. It's to make sure that everybody knows how to recognize an ethics issue, and that everybody has some sort of beginning ability to discuss it. Because I think that trying to, if we hang our hats on showing that ethics education works to change behavior or to change patient outcomes, we can get little bits of answers here and there, but it strikes me it might be entirely the wrong question. So I think that I wanna, I wanna present that and sort of see if we can maybe have a better conversation about what are the goals of ethics education, I mean, what we think they ought to be. And then the final point is that I think one of the things that we have done wrong for a very long time is we, uh, we sort of subject students to ethics education without looking first to see what their actual needs are. So as nice as we all are, a whole lot of ethics education remains very much teacher-centered. I'm yes. gonna tell you what I think you ought to know. Instead of going, and the times that I've had a chance to do this, actually do some observational work to see what the ethics questions faced by the residents in the clinics are, it ends up offering and creating a very different curriculum than sort of the standard big ticket item curriculums that we tend to teach. So I think there's a couple of sort of very basic pedagogical tools that we need. And one of them is a careful, clear-headed, evidence-based needs assessment. We keep trying to fly by that and just teach the things that we're most interested in or the things that we see they may not be the things that our students need from us. So I think I, we need to get a little bit more real about ethics education and, and sort of humble ourselves to actually look at it from the point of view of the learner as opposed to the teacher. That's great. Thank you. No, before you step down, I'm going to steal this and ask one question of you as well, which is, you know, your point about getting more faculty and more even residents involved in the teaching. How do you plan to structure that type of curriculum? Um, is it just going to be, in a sense, 202 versus Ethics 101? <laughs> or, I mean, I think it's a really important question. How do we train the trainers type of thing? And, you know, Besides we, making them go through an entire year-long ethics program. Exactly. Did you want to offer that? Sh sure. Um, 
Karen Devon, University of Toronto. So um, I just got some funding in Toronto to take a concept that actually I witnessed here through Peter and the surgical group, which is called Ethics M&Ms, um, where we discuss an ethics case once a month at a regular M&Ms rounds. And so when I got to Toronto, I started doing that with the residents at my institution. There's 11 teaching hospitals that make up the system. And what I do is I actually created a template and have the residents work through the case um, sort of with me mentoring them. And then they teach the faculty faculty and the rest of the group um, about the particular issue. So the interesting thing that's happened is that they then go to other hospitals and say, are we doing ethics M&Ms here? And so the funding I got was to now do this sort of across the city and potentially across disciplines and hopefully wider. But the, um, I think the point that you made about sort of measuring things, um, you know, when you apply for funding for this kind of things, they want you to measure. And the educational theory that I'm using is called transformative learning. And so it's really just to uh, do some qualitative research on how um, residents or faculty are just changing in their culture. It's very palpable to me when I'm in the M&Ms to see how even in my small group of 10 surgeons, um, the culture has changed. And in fact, at cases that I'm not present, they're discussing ethics. And so to me, that's sort of the wow. end goal. Um, and I think it's, I'm really focusing on the residents um, and students teaching the faculty to feel comfortable with this. So. That is fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.